Welcome, everybody, to the world of dyslexia. Probably this road worker meant to write school, but he didn't. This person is probably dyslexic, as are about 10% of the world population. Think of that. 10% of you, such as a block like here, is significantly or mildly struggling with the ability to read and spell natively. And that's a big problem. For the other 90% who think, uh, uh, I'm not dyslexic, let you get a little bit of an experience what it feels like to be dyslexic. So I'm going to show one slide, and I expect all of you to read it straight away, and I give you five seconds, and if you don't get it right, you'll be frustrated. Let's see what it works. Are you guys ready? Yeah. Okay, three, two, one. Thank you very much. <laughs> This meant to be the gift of dyslexia is the ability to think multidimensionally, while the ability to see in pictures and to change one's point of focus and reference point is a handicap in reading. It may be also the source of something. Is that easy? No, it's not. It's horrible. So children who experience dyslexia have a similar frustration if they try to read and spell properly. I'm not dyslexic. But I have a sort of similar problem when making music. Um, I play the bass, and I can argue that the real rhythm is given by the bass and not the bebop. And <laughs> the bass you can do in a jazz setting. And jazz is very much intuition, because we follow each other, you listen to each other, you, you see the timing, and you get from in, within the content you're playing. Also, I now then play classical music in an orchestra. An orchestra means sheet reading, reading what's written out there, which is very analytical. And I've always struggled to read uh, sheet music very quickly. At, a, at some point, I even get sort of a block. When music is very quickly, it feels like this for me, and I'm actually not able to play as fluent as many of my friends who are perhaps of the same level musicians are. Um, well, this similar feeling um, for music is okay. Music is a luxury, but it's actually a real problem when you have that feeling with reading and writing, because reading and writing is a life skill we need before we even can think of excellence we like to think of today. So this boy is about six or seven years old. He is like, he's suffering from dyslexia, which means he will probably have a backlog in learning. But if it's not addressed properly, he might actually have a backlog. He, he gets to more behavioral problems or even social-emotional problems. Um, dyslexia is nothing new. It has been every time. It's not a fashionable, fashionable thing. Even great thinkers in our world have suffered from dyslexia, and despite that, or, sorry for that, perhaps thanks to that, they, get, they got to great heights, because it's commonly known that, sure, it might be more difficult to read, but people with dyslexia, such as this man here, had a much more vivid imagination, and perhaps that's the reason why he came to the theories he helped us to, to design with. Um, this boy, dyslexia here in the Netherlands or in another country where we proud ourselves of, of advanced educational system. What does it mean? Well, this boy, he comes to school and he will be sort of followed one, two, three or four times a year. Uh, schools nowadays take tests, so they trace a child. If a child is doing badly, they will probably give some extra attention. And if he still is doing badly, he will probably be referred to an external specialist who does a lot of tests, writes a report, sends a report back to the teacher, and there you go. Then the teacher has to take on this dyslexic child um, and help him accordingly. This is what we call labeling. Um, our educational system is very advanced, and don't get me wrong, it's truly very advanced in identifying different sort of learning abilities or disabilities. Um, dyslexia, and you can extend with ADHD and other related difficulties. But the problem with the label is that it sticks. If a child has once heard he or she is dyslexic, he will probably never forget it. And even worse, he might sort of say, well, I don't understand what I'm doing here, but well, I am dyslexic, so I shouldn't be able to do it as easily as the others. So labeling is not a bad thing in itself, but when you don't do it properly, it actually becomes a bad thing. Um, and the result in the Netherlands, at least, is on the one hand, strangely enough, overdiagnosis. So children that are labeled, but actually they are not dyslexic, but they might have other trouble with learning and to read and write. <clears throat> and the other side is underdiagnosis. Children who only belatedly 
get um, the proper extra attention they need. Um, well, the story of Mike comes in here. About two years ago, I was studying at MIT, and I took a fantastic class at the MIT Media Lab, where they tried to put together people with a science background and people with a more entrepreneurial background. And the objective was to solve a real-life problem using big data and using uh, mobile data. And when I graduated, I had the choice, do I go back into private sector work or perhaps public sector work? And I decided to actually start an experiment. And I set up a foundation whose objective it is to solve um, educational problems using learning analytics, and more specifically, big data in this case. And the first experiment we ran for the past year was to try and use that big data to solve dyslexia. <clears throat> so, big data sounds very complex, and actually it is. I'm not the perfect person to do all that. So we sought a team of an artificial intelligence person who is a mathematician by background. Secondly, we found a woman more, more recently who is a psychologist and who has done a lot of dyslexia testing and treatment of children. And thirdly, we found a software engineer who understands how to translate all that into something that people in the class might actually find useful. So this process you then go through is simplifying a little bit a circle. You start by gathering data. So the data that we have are the data of children age 7, 8 doing exercises in class. Very simple spelling and reading exercises on the tablet. A couple of hundreds of children we followed for a whole year and this gives sort of millions of data points. The second step is to analyze that data. For that analysis, you need someone with artificial intelligence skills. He doesn't necessarily have to understand the whole idea of education at all. All they do is identify patterns. And the patterns are somewhat like this. A child is doing quite well in spelling, but on certain exercises, he suddenly has a drop. And then he's doing quite well again, and suddenly has a drop again. And this is what we mean as sort of an anomaly, sort of a strange pattern that you can't explain just thinking of the, uh, the intelligence of the child. Um, to then understand these patterns, you need someone with um, understanding of education itself. So we were lucky enough to work not only with a research department who was advising us from the University of Amsterdam from artificial intelligence, but with another research department who uh, are from the pedagogy, pedagogy faculty. <clears throat> so in that whole process, you get wonderful, difficult charts like this. Don't try to understand. It basically means you look a pattern, you try to understand it, you go back, you try to understand it, go back. And that's a whole iterative process that this step two and three involve. But then we get to the last step, the fourth step, translating an algorithm that you generate. And the algorithm helps us to sort of identify dyslexia earlier, more specific and more hopefully accurately than the current testing methodologies. And once you have that, and we currently have a, I would call it a raw algorithm that we need to refine in several more iterations. But once you have that, you have to translate that into something that's actually meaningful for the people on the ground, for the teachers, for the educational experts, and who knows, for their parents. So to do that, you have to talk to people, talk to educationists in the sort of era of paper education and in the era of uh, online tablet education. And the exciting thing is that we are currently exactly at that, at that shifting point that schools, two years ago in the Netherlands, there was about 70 schools who had some sort of tablets in the school. Currently, it's around 10% of all schools, which means that in, I could say, about five years' time, most schools in a country like ours will use tablet. Most schools will be in an environment like this. And if you have that, you can... Um, build that algorithm and translate it into sort of use user-friendly interfaces. And if we look back to what we've done in the past year, which was very much focused on a very narrow field because changing everything using big data sounds lovely, but it's not really realistic. This is difficult enough already. So we wanted to look at a very narrow field. However, if you look back, we think there are a few takeaways that we can distill from this dyslexia experiment. The first one being that what we currently try to do is label one green fish and the rest is orange. But 
as many of you already have touched upon today, personalization is going to be much refined of education, which means that you really understand each individual child and deliver education in such a way that he, can, he or she can flourish the best. So if we are able to do this using big data, we are a lucky team. However, getting a step further is actually not that remote, because all you do is having different type of data, different type of analyses, and hopefully getting more to learning analytics that decide on the sort of learning strategy that is suitable for a child. If a research group in the world is already doing that, it would be great. I hope they can get to more personalized education that way. Second takeaway. These are silos. What we found uh, is a world with fantastic experts, not just in the Netherlands, but also in the UK, where we worked from for a year earlier. All these experts, they are specialists, and unless they talk to you together, like they forced us to do during that class at MIT, unless they talk together, you're never going to come to a solution that's actually beneficial for everyone and takes to account, into account the knowledge of the artificial intelligence, the knowledge of the psychologist and the pedagogist, and the knowledge of the human computer interaction specialist. We were lucky enough to have those experts who were constantly talking to each other. But in real world, I think it's a challenge to achieve that same level. Just to give it a, a tiny example, uh, three months ago, we were at a conference in, uh, in Belgium, in the University of Leuven, on learning analytics. And all the people we talked to had a background in mathematics and computer science. Virtually none of them had a decent, quote unquote, background in, in education or, or on the ground experience. But they are the people who build the tools to power those tablets, to do analytics, and to change the classrooms in, in, a, in a pace we can't probably predict easily. Then a couple of weeks ago, a great event here in the Bali in Amsterdam with the future of education. Great experts in the field were talking to the audience and discussing with each other. But they were only with a background in pedagogy, a bit psychometric, but really diehard sort of educational traditional background. Well, if you only have mathematicians together, you're not going to heal, or you're not going to create great solutions. And you only have pedagogues together, you miss the opportunity technology gives us. Anyone who has the chance, please try and break their silos, and conferences like this are fantastic to do that, and already much of what I've been hearing today is going in that right direction. Final point, um, three steps that are quite common in, in data analysis for big data, but often forgotten. Decision maker insights data. What we often do, we say we have this fantastic data set, and then you start analyzing the data and, and off you go. But what's the real approach to, to, to take is to first start, all right, who is the person I'm doing this for? Who is the decision maker? Who is the person responsible for a certain learning environment? And often that's the teacher. And that teacher needs specific insights to be able to make the right decisions. And let me make that very concrete. A right decision will be to tell a child, you're not stupid, but just practice a little bit more. Or to ask the parents, could you please read him or her a few more stories even every night? Because that enriches vocabulary. He might have a mild sort of dyslexia, but actually with that intervention, he'll be able to succeed quite well. Those are the small insights and the small decisions that make the real difference in education. And then from insights, you need to find the right data to be able to do analysis. And taking back a small step to the current education that we have, I told about this fantastic experts outside the classrooms and real dedicated, strong teachers inside the classrooms. But if the expert outside the classroom makes a decision, or at least an analysis of data, and makes a report, and the teacher reads it, not necessarily the teacher is going to understand those difficult analyses. I'm not saying teachers are not um, um, intelligent enough for that, but data analysis is a very difficult thing. So to be able to do that, you should rather bring the analysis and the person taking a decision to the same person and empowering the teacher to make decisions. Bear in mind, it says decision maker. And I think there's a fundamental point when it comes to all sorts of smart, fancy things with technology and education. A decision can and should never be made by a machine or a fancy algorithm. It will always have to be, in my view, the person who actually has a responsibility and then can interpret data. However, we hope to be able to empower that person to make 
earlier, smarter, and more refined decisions to intervene when, difficult, when children have difficulty, difficulties with reading and to take the measures when it's really needed. And in that way, hopefully, we can avoid a certain degree of labeling that we are currently used to and that we are almost a bit addicted to. Um, hopefully, this experiment that's still going on is going to bring part of the answer that lets us have a base skill of reading, writing for everyone and allow not just that frustrated, that happy girl, but also the frustrated little boy to excel and become excellent afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you.